Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, Best Way Tours and Safaris, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, today we are covering an area of the world which is absolutely fascinating, which is uh, our journeys to Eastern Europe and Russia. Shortly, Best Way Tours will have a beautiful brochure available for all of you, uh, which relates all these various journeys to you. My name is Peter Langer, and I'm the Destination Marketing and Education Specialist of Bestway Tours and Safaris. A little bit about our company. Uh, we have been operating small group cultural journeys since 1978. We do operate tours to well over 100 countries, and have organized a number of special tours for a number of universities, museums, and other renowned institutions. Another interesting thing we have uh, discovered is a type of client which collects World Heritage Sites. Hence, we have created a specialized division which is called World Heritage Tours. These tours are actually itineraries that feature cultural and natural heritage sites uh, inscribed in the World Heritage List of uh, UNESCO, which are considered as having outstanding universal value. At present, there are well over 900 of these World Heritage Sites. And uh, it's an interesting concept to uh, actually uh, offer to people uh, places which not always are a, a easily accessible because uh, some of these World Heritage Sites are actually a little bit out of the way. And uh, the whole idea is to focus on the beautiful heritage of our world. Today we are going to talk about our special tour coming up in uh, 2012, which is the Balkan Mosaic. To get an idea of the concept of the Balkans, let's have a look at the geography. As a matter of fact, this part of uh, southeastern Europe, the Balkans, it's actually an old word in Ottoman, which means forested mountains. The Balkans are uh, comprise Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Greece, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Slovenia. They have an ancient, ancient history. Uh, in the time of the Roman Empire, for example, uh, Dalmatia was very important. A number of uh, Roman emperors stemmed from here. The prefecture of Illyricum was mostly what, uh, what covered this area. And of course, Macedonia, whether it's the country of Macedonia or the part of, uh, or the province of Greece, we really have a great amount of history stemming back well over 2,500 years. The Balkans also were at the forefront of the clash of three empires, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. Through, through many, many years, particularly towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, there were a number of uh, wars as the Ottoman Empire was slowly disintegrating. The Austro-Hungarian Empire also was encroaching on it. And so there was a number of wars uh, which were eventually settled in 1913 where we came up with some sort of a settlement. However, um, due to uh, the murder of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in the city of Sarajevo in 1914, the Balkans also were the, um, how could we say, uh, the main cause of the events which precipitated into the First World War. After this horrible conflict in 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne created a country uh, called Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia, which roughly retained the same borders even after the Second World War, was this uh, Yugo means south. So in, in essence, what they did is they put a hodgepodge of countries together, calling them the Slavs of the South, Yugoslavia. After the fall of communism in uh, 1989, the old, uh, the old communist system had also uh, lost control, and old nationalisms came about. Uh, hence, uh, there was a number of wars in the Balkans in between Serbia and Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, 
and really uh, finally this has uh, disintegrated into seven separate countries. That can be explained to, to the, uh, first of all, this is a mountainous region. And because there are mountains, there's a lot, uh, in, the, in the olden times, it was very difficult for people to move. Hence, you create a mountain culture uh, where your ethnicity or your belonging to a certain group was very, very important. Uh, on this map, you can see the different ethnic and uh, language and religious groups which formed in the Balkans over the centuries. And this is what makes this particular itinerary so absolutely fascinating, because in a short few days, we're going to travel through cultures, language groups, which are incredibly different. The tour uh, comprises all of the countries in the Balkans, including as well Slovenia, which we offer as an extension, simply because uh, it used to be part of the uh, former uh, Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go country by country and we are going to go to the various places which we have highlighted on this absolutely fascinating tour. The best time to go to the Balkans is uh, usually during summer, from May to October, with its dry and clear days. Uh, the Adriatic coast, uh, mainly in Croatia, has Mediterranean climate and can be visited for even longer, from March to November. From North America, there are no direct flights to the Balkans, but there are excellent connections via Amsterdam, Frankfurt, London, Munich, Paris and Vienna. And of course, uh, all of these countries are easily connected by railroad or air from uh, uh, nearby European countries. First and foremost, let's look at Serbia. Serbia is at the heart of the Balkans with a population of 7.5 million people. Its capital city is Belgrade, and the official language is Serbian, and they use the Cyrillic writing system. The Serbians are in a great majority Orthodox Christians. Now what I would like to highlight in regards to this particular tour is because we are traveling in a relatively fast pace from place to place, crossing borders, crossing cultures, uh, having different writing systems, different religions, it's an ideal tour. It's not as easy as other parts of Europe to travel independently in. There are no rail connections in many of these countries or if the railway arrives, for example, if people were thinking of doing it on the Eurail Pass, um, there are certain countries such as Albania or Macedonia which are simply not connected by rail, and other points it's very difficult to get to simply uh, by just by taking the train, getting on, getting off. Our tour commences in the city of Belgrade. Belgrade has been actually the capital city of uh, Serbia since 1401. The city has 1.2 uh, million inhabitants and it's located uh, very close to the Danube River. What is so lovely about uh, the city of uh, Belgrade is that you can explore it, uh, quite a lot of it, on foot. For example, one of uh, Europe's nicest uh, pedestrian street is uh, the Nes Mihaljova street where you can wander endlessly, particularly in summer it's lovely to go down the street, enjoy perhaps an ice cream or a coffee. Uh, it definitely has a Central European feeling. In many ways uh, we tend to think that you might be in, in Austria, but it has that wonderful feeling. Uh, on our tour uh, we will see the 19th century quarters and a, less, a lot of quirkiness in the Balkans. For example, you have this wonderful 19th century inn, which has no name. Actually, it does have a name. It's the question mark inn. And there was always a sign, because nobody knew really what this was called. So now it's become one of the wonderful attractions of the, um, of the city of Belgrade, is to go and uh, enjoy a snack or a drink at this incredible little hotel, which is a question mark. So I wonder how you will find that actually on the Internet. Another number of, we will see another of other number of monuments, for example, the Cathedral of St. Sava. The Cathedral of St. Sava 
is at the, as a matter of fact, the largest, largest Orthodox cathedral on the Balkans. Another wonderful uh, aspect of, uh, of the city of Belgrade is to elect, explore Kalemekdan Fortress. This fortress has been evolving for well over uh, 2,000 years. The most important uh, uh, aspect of it uh, is uh, the, was built roughly in the 18th century with original ramparts, gateways, towers, some Turkish monuments and some even ancient older Roman monuments. What is uh, interesting about it as you explore the uh, Kalemekdan fortress on foot is you get to see different types uh, throughout history, throughout European history, and the setting is absolutely spectacular in a park. Uh, what I tend to recommend uh, to many of our passengers is to uh, just go for a walk in the park, particularly when you've come from a long transatlantic flight. It's a wonderful, refreshing walk through all these forested trees and so on and so forth before we embark on, uh, on our tour. Also, throughout uh, Belgrade, there's a number of beautiful restaurants, and in summer, for example, to eat outside is uh, a, a wonderful experience. The food tends to be Central European, with the same type of food you would eat in, in Austria, in Germany, in Hungary. Very, very delicious food, good wines, good beers, and it's a nice way to start your Balkan journey. On um, the uh, third day of our tour, we are having a very, very busy day. We start traveling, first of all, a bit south in Serbia, and we go to the Sarganska Osmica. The Sarganska Osmica is actually a very old train. It dates from the uh, 19th century, and it travels for 15 kilometers uh, through uh, 20 tunnels and over 10 bridges in this beautiful forest of the rain. Uh, for railway buffs, this is an absolute must, as it is one of the traditional trains, which are still steam trains, which are left in Europe. After this, we go to uh, Visgerad. Now, Visgerad uh, is uh, not in Serbia per se. It's in the Republika Srpska, uh, part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The bridge in Visgarat was designed by a famous uh, Ottoman architect, uh, Sinan, was completed in 1571. And it's actually an Ottoman uh, structure which was built out of pumice stone. Um, and um, it is actually um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Whenever you see uh, this particular sign here, that is the sign of UNESCO World Heritage. And as you will see throughout this webinar, we are going to be going through a lot of World Heritage Sites. For a collector, this is an ideal itinerary. From Visgerat, we return to uh, Serbia proper, and we go to Mount Slatibor uh, National Park. Uh, Mount Slatibor National Park is uh, particular because it is actually one of the last wildlife refugee areas for bears in Europe. Uh, it's actually very, it's funny, we see all these bears all over on the various uh, coats of arms. However, there's very few bears left in Europe, and Mount Slatipur will, uh, will have them. What is also very, very nice is there is an open-air um, museum in, uh, the, uh, in, in the vicinity of Mount Slatipur, and that is uh, Sirogoino. This is actually a um, open air uh, traditional architecture museum, and we are actually going to be staying uh, close in a hotel on our third night here, basically to get a feeling for the rural lifestyle, which hasn't changed all that much, and see this beautiful uh, traditional architecture. You also have uh, world famous hand knitted wares for sale, uh, certain clothes. This is where the traditional, uh, these very colorful Serbian costumes come from. The next day, we are going to explore uh, the first World Heritage of the day, and that is the Studenica Monastery. This is a very important monastery. Uh, it's also the King's Monastery. 
It dates uh, from the 12th century. And there is a number of uh, important, um, um, important churches and um, monuments in Studenica Monastery. Um, the Monastery Circle con uh, has monuments which have been built over 130 years and several Serbian rulers had a hand in their construction. So it's very, very important to the whole development of the Orthodox Church on the Balkans. And as I mentioned before, this is also an UNESCO World Heritage Site. From the Studenica Monastery, we uh, travel, uh, it's actually not that far, to the Sopochani Monastery. The Sopochani Monastery, it's also an UNESCO World Heritage Site, is an endowment by King Uros from the 13th century. Where, where, where this monastery is uh, not so famous for its architecture, what really makes it very, very famous and important uh, is probably one of the most magnificent monuments of European medieval art are all the mural pa paintings which were, which were painted as we mentioned in the 13th century. Um, it is a unique place uh, as this is an early development of uh, perspective and certain color techniques which are only visible in this Sopokanchi monastery. In the end we go to uh, the place of uh, Novi Pazar which is actually a small village with a population of only 60,000. In the evening, we will uh, go down to town and meet with the locals and uh, have a wonderful experience of this multicultural. You can see there's a number of mosques and churches uh, all uh, together before we head to the next country, which is Kosovo. Kosovo has a population of approximately 1.8 million. Its capital city is the city of Pristina. Now Kosovo has a number of languages. Of course the principal ones are Albanian and Serbian, but they are also officially recognized uh, are Turkish, Gorani, Romani, Bosnian. Now unlike Serbia, Kosovo uses the Latin alphabet. And about 90% of the people in Kosovo believe in uh, Islam. On our way down to Kosovo, we will visit the, the Chani Monastery. This one is also a World Heritage Site. It actually belongs to uh, five uh, monasteries which are all um, part of the World Heritage Site of the monasteries of, in, in Kosovo. We will visit the, the Chani Monastery, also the Patriarch of Pech. Uh, this monastery is also a World Heritage Site and it was actually recently restored with uh, the help of UNESCO. Once we've seen these monasteries, it's time to see a little bit of modernity. And we travel to the city of Pristina. Pristina is actually the capital of uh, Kosovo. Uh, what is interesting about Pristina um, because of the Kosovo War in uh, 1999 to 2000, they have a great admiration for uh, President Bill Clinton who brought in the peace accords and put an end to the slaughter in Kosovo. Uh, hence you will find the Bill Clinton Boulevard, the Bill Clinton Square, and there's even a very large image of Bill Clinton. Also what we visit in uh, the city of Pristina is a monument to, uh, to Skanderbeg, who is the great Albanian hero in the, from the early uh, 14th century. One wonderful thing throughout uh, uh, Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia is to enjoy the lovely food. To, uh, the food in general terms tends to be, uh, of, uh, tends to be Turkish and appears to be um, um, very, it's always freshly made, it's delicious uh, and um, you can eat it anywhere, on the street it's safe, you don't need necessarily to always eat in the restaurant and part of a trip, and in the Balkans this is really not a problem, is to enjoy the local food by eating from a stall for example. As we leave uh, the city of Pristina, we will visit our third uh, World Heritage Site of the day, and that's the Gratsanica Monastery. 
This monastery was built as well in the um, 15th century and has beautiful uh, icono, uh, icons. The whole iconostasis is, is quite interesting. A lot of it that has been darkened mostly because of the smoke from the various candles. I'd like to remind you that many of these monasteries are still, they're not museums and monuments, they're still working monasteries, so you will encounter the priests and uh, it is a, a living culture we're exploring here, not uh, just a museum piece. From Kosovo, uh, actually from Pristina to Skopje, it's only an hour and a half drive, and we enter into Macedonia. Or uh, many times you will not find Macedonia on a map. Uh, it, you will always find it under FYRO Macedonia. What, what that means is the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, which is the official name of the country until now, simply because uh, Greece put uh, an objection to the use of the name Macedonia, and that's been an ongoing bureaucratic fight. Macedonia has a population of 2 million 100,000, and its capital city is the city of Skopje. The language is uh, Macedonian, and here again, unlike Kosovo, where they use the Latin writing system, they use the Cyrillic writing system. The uh, most important religion here, two-thirds of the people are Orthodox Christians, and one-third uh, uh, are Muslims. In our exploration of the city of Skopje, or Skupi, uh, we will uh, we'll visit the old town, or the Charshi. Um, here again, we will find a magnificent piece of uh, Ottoman engineering. This is the uh, old town bridge, which was built uh, by the Turks in the 15th century. There are also some interesting uh, churches and monasteries, which date back 600 years or so uh, in, uh, the, um, in, in this typical mix of uh, Christian Orthodox religion. The thing is, uh, in Skopje, when you explore the town, you will see this diversity and this mix. From Skopje, we will travel to yet another World Heritage Site, which is the town and the lake of Orit. Now, here we have a mixture uh, in Orit. On one hand, it's a natural site, and on the other hand, it's a cultural world heritage site. Um, uh, Orit is a very old town. Uh, it dates back to 1,500 years. It was called um, Lik uh, Likitna, uh, is the city of lights in the times of the ancient Greeks. Orit is also a very religious uh, city. Uh, what is interesting about Orit as well is that the Cyrillic writing system was uh, invented here by the brothers Cyril and Methodi. So all that Cyrillic writing, which extends all the way to Russia and Greece and uh, most of the Balkans, was invented in the city of Orit. You will still see some ancient Greco-Latin ruins, such as, for example, this amphitheater, and then some Paleo-Christian architecture, meaning this is some of the earliest Christian sites in the world. What is fascinating about Orit as well is that Orit has uh, 365 different churches. So you can actually go and pray every day of the week uh, in a different church. There's also a beautiful fortress which overlooks the, the whole town. The best way, actually, to explore uh, the city of Orit is, approx uh, is on foot. It's the best way to see it. You go from church to church and also feel the atmosphere of history coming alive. A lot of the parts of Orit are actually uh, pedestrian-only access, which obviously makes sense then to go via a, vo uh, via a walking tour. You will also find quite a lot of this uh, traditional Ottoman architecture. In some ways, uh, some of the streets in Orit remind you very much, or reminded me when I went there, uh, of the ancient uh, parts or the old parts of Istanbul. A lot of that is being bulldozed away in uh, Istanbul itself, 
but in, in Orit and in Albania and other parts, we still find this traditional Ottoman architecture. From Orit, which is very close to the border of Albania, we travel to this amazing country. Albania has a population of 3 million inhabitants. The capital city is Tirana. The Albanian is the official language, but Italian is widely spoken. At some point in time, Italy, Italy took over, uh, in the early 20th century, took over the control of Albania. 70% of their population is Muslim, 20% Orthodox Christian, and 10% are Roman Catholic. Now, the way we travel on our tour is directly from Orit to the city of Berat. Uh, Berat is, as a matter of fact, yet another world uh, heritage site. Uh, it is an absolutely adorable little town. You go and explore it. Once again, in this case, it's not a particular monument, a particular church, uh, or uh, it's the whole city which has been declared a World Heritage Site. You have a fair mix of ancient monasteries. These are approximately a thousand uh, years old, and mosques. Look at this iconostasis. It's a very, very uh, traditional, very primitive, still built out of wood without all the ornamentation which came much later in the 18th or 19th centuries. And as I mentioned, the wonderful thing, the charming thing about visiting Berat is to wander uh, its street. The uh, city slopes down actually from a mountain called Timori with a castle which overlooks the city. There is a number of mosques as well. The bazaar is interesting. And because it's a World Heritage Site, no modern developments have been allowed. So in many ways, part of the beauty of going to these World Heritage Sites is that these places are preserved and they cannot build, let's say, a modern high-rise or a shopping center or anything of this nature. From there, we travel to the port of Durres. Durres, or formerly known also Durazzo, uh, is an ancient place. Uh, it is the second largest city of uh, Albania and pretty much its oldest town. It has been around for approximately 2,500 years. You have here the many ruins, especially from the Illyrian king, uh, Epidamnos, which uh, called actually Dures, uh, the, 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 the town was called Ep Epidamnos. Uh, there has been some excavations of the amphitheater, for example. Yet, a lot of Albania is changing, and it's changing rapidly. Twenty years ago, all there was in Albania were 120 kilometers of paved roads. That has boomed and changed with a lot of influx uh, money from the European community. We now find quite a bit of modernity. Uh, talking about modernity, we go to the city of Tirana. Tirana, albeit it was founded in 1614 on the site of a Byzantine fortress, is actually in many ways a modern city. It has been the capital of Albania since 1920. And you can see here classic socialist architecture. Here you see the great Albanian people in the National Theater, the mosaic. It's very classic Stalinistic architecture. And uh, hence, it represents a time of the 20th century, which was quite horrible. But at the same time, it gives you an idea of the, uh, of the great monumentalist sort of architecture which existed then. For more uh, traditional architecture, we also have uh, Skanderbeg uh, Square. This one is actually has an interesting mosque nearby. But the city of Tirana is actually visited more so to uh, get an idea of the friendly Albanians. It's changing very quickly, and I can nothing but suggest to go now. Uh, probably amongst the friendliest people I've met in Europe. Of course, you still have the traditional European markets, which have disappeared in all of Europe. For example, like this honey vendor, who's selling different types of honey. And my God, this man was so friendly, he wanted me to try every one of his honeys, although I told him I couldn't take them. Who knows if they are pasteurized or so. You really get a sense of the old traditional Europe. In some of the cases, 
look at these bottles, they were filled with uh, still bits of, uh, of bees or flies. But it really, you still have that feeling of old Europe. From Albania, we travel uh, north to Montenegro. Montenegro is actually the least populated of the countries in the Balkans. This is the uh, population is only 666,000. The capital is Podgorica. Montenegrin, Montenegrin is the official language. However, Serbian, Bosnian, Albanian and Croatian are recognized in usage. In Montenegro, again, they used a Cyrillic writing system. 74.2% of uh, the Montenegrins are Orthodox Christians, with the remainder being Muslims and Roman Catholics. The first place we will visit uh, in uh, Montenegro is the uh, city of Budva. Budva is absolutely lovely. It's again a beautiful town on uh, the Adriatic Sea. It was very important uh, in the 15th century uh, who created uh, when the city was really created. Mostly what you enjoy is the beautiful views of the Adriatic Sea in combination with this lovely architecture. And a stroll through many of these towns is probably one of the main reasons to go on this tour. Talking about amazingly beautiful towns, we go to Kotor. Kotor, the entire town, as a matter of fact, has been designated an UNESCO World Heritage Site. Kotor was inhabited since the time of the Illyrians. And once again, what is so lovely about Kotor is there is no traffic, there is no vehicles. So when we go and explore the town, obviously on foot, we will not be encumbered by uh, cars and motorbikes and so on. Um, you might notice as well in the case of, of Kotor and throughout the Adriatic coast, quite a bit of Italian influence. A lot of these places, Kotor, uh, Dubrovnik, um, Split, were occupied by the Republic of Venice in their day. Hence there is a bit of an influence. Look at this clock tower, for example, or at the windows, the restaurant. This is pure Venetian style. As I said, the entire city of Kotor is an UNESCO World Heritage Site. And to wander through the streets, Kotor really in many ways resembles Venice without the 50 million tourists. Uh, when you wander through all these wonderful streets and get lost. There is a number of uh, churches, uh, Orthodox churches as well in Kotor. Some are very, very small and very intimate. But you have this incredible mix um, of, of, of uh, Orthodox churches, Italian architecture, uh, and again, um, as I said, it's a very intimate experience when you visit uh, Kotor. You see here, for example, on this particular building, there is the traditional Venetian lion, or that actually this is the sign of St. Mark, which is uh, the traditional symbol of the Republic of Venice. In front of Kotor, there is a number of islands which are jutted out. Many of them will have churches or other structures. From uh, Kotor, we travel directly into Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, Bosnia and Herzegovina has 3.8 million inhabitants, and uh, the country is called the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Its capital city is the city of Sarajevo, but de facto, uh, we have uh, the country split into two countries or two sub-regions. One is the Republika Srpska or Serb Republic and its de facto capital is the city of Banja Luka, on the, which is located here. On the other hand, the actual capital of the entire of Bosnia and Herzegovina is Sarajevo. The language which is which are spoken here are Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian and a number of minority languages. And unlike Montenegro and Serbia, the system of writing which is used here is the Latin writing system. The population uh, belongs to Islam at approximately 45%, 36% are Orthodox Christian, and 15% are Roman Catholic. The first place we visit is the city of Sarajevo. 
Sarajevo has had a tragic role in the history of the world. For uh, starters, in 1914, Gavrilo Princip uh, murdered the Archduke Franz Ferdinand here. He was an anarchist uh, who wanted to get rid of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, in many ways he succeeded. It is exa exactly on this point that Gavrilo Princip uh, shot the, uh, the Archduke. Uh, this triggered, uh, through a series of unfortunate events, the First World War. Uh, later, then, the city became the headquarters of the Olymp Winter Olympic Games, but really um, the city of Sarajevo mostly suffered in the 1990s. As a matter of fact, um, the siege of Sarajevo during the various Yugoslav wars uh, lasted from the 5th of April 1992 to the 29th of February 1996, and it's the longest siege of any capital city in the history of modern warfare. The population before the war was 450,000. After the war, as you can see through the cemetery, um, only 300,000 people were left in the city. That does not mean that all of them were killed. Approximately 10,000 people died in the conflict. A lot of people fled uh, Sarajevo and uh, located to other parts of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina or emigrated altogether. What is so wonderful about uh, Sarajevo is once again you get that old Ottoman feeling. You will feel like again in some old Turkish town of the 19th century and in many ways uh, if you wouldn't know that this is Sarajevo I could uh, tell you that this is Istanbul or Izmir or any of the Turkish places because it has a distinct uh, Turkish feel. That is also expressed in the various uh, tea houses, cafes, the <coughs> places. It really has that wonderful Ottoman or shall I say Turkish feeling. From uh, Sarajevo we do travel to Medugorje. This is actually a Catholic pilgrimage site. Um, in, 1980, uh, sorry, in 1981, several local children uh, received messages of the Virgin Mary. This was confirmed by the Vatican, hence it became a huge pilgrimage place for people from all over the world. Uh, it is very interesting to listen to Filipinos talk in Tagalog or Mexicans in Spanish and Catholics from all over the world uh, come on to Medugorje to pay their respects to the Virgin in the same way as they do in Fatima in Portugal or they do in um, Lourdes uh, in France. Very close by, about 15 minutes away from Medugorje, we uh, travel to Mostar. Mostar is once again the old town and the bridge of Mostar are a world heritage site. What is important uh, to note is uh, that the bridge of Mostar was probably the, long, the widest man-made arch in the world until that time. It was commissioned by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1557 and took nine years to build. As a matter of fact, the architect, whose name was Mimar uh, Hayrudin, uh, was, char uh, was charged to build the bridge. And if the bridge would not have been perfect, he would be killed. So actually, the uh, night before the scaffolding came off, he decided to sleep under the bridge. He'd rather be killed by the bridge falling on him rather than suffering some painful death by being boiled in oil or something. Fortunately for him, the bridge sustained and it lasted for many years until it was bombed uh, to smithereens during the war. Fortunately, the World Bank, the uh, Aga Khan Trust for Culture, the World's Monument Fund, the European Community, and UNESCO all got together uh, and uh, built a coalition to oversee the reconstruction of the Stari Most, of this wonderful bridge, which was rebuilt from June 2001 and, uh, to 2004. The nice thing about it is because the explosion was such Many of the original stones were used in the reconstruction, so that they didn't have to build a concrete. They really actually reconstructed the bridge under the original plans which were still uh, available. 
from uh, Mostar we then go down to the city of Dubrovnik um, the, the, in Croatia. Croatia has a population of four and a half million inhabitants. Its capital city is the city of Zagreb. The Croatian is the official language and here once again they use the Latin alphabet. And unlike all the other uh, countries in the Balkans, here close to 90% of the population is Roman Catholic. The capital of uh, Zagreb uh, is a wonderful town which in many ways uh, reminds us of the um, of the of old Vienna. In many ways it has that Austro-Hungarian feeling with the secession style. You have these beautiful markets, a wonderful Gothic cathedral to explore, the National Theater, and if you look at this theater, you could very well think that this is in Salzburg or in Vienna. It is very well, the, the distance from one city to the other is not that far, but you definitely can see the influence of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We then travel to Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik again is a world heritage city. So anything in, uh, within that fortress in Dubrovnik is actually a world heritage site. The whole city was uh, also somewhat damaged in the wars of the 1990s, yet it has maintained its beautiful character. Uh, it is located on the Adriatic Sea, gorgeous port facility, and um, there, uh, as Venice occupied the city of Dubrovnik, we will see quite a number of uh, sites which were built actually by the Venetians. The advantage of going on this tour, and I do realize that Dubrovnik is on many of the tour circuits throughout uh, the um, throughout the uh, Mediterranean cruises is that the cruise passengers, and they come literally by the thousands, uh, they come during the day. Usually the cruise passengers will be here from about 11 o'clock in the morning till about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and, and, and filling up all the streets. But for the rest of the time, the city is absolutely wonderful. We'll be spending two nights in Dubrovnik, which will give our uh, clients plenty of time to explore the city and to actually enjoy it. Um, the uh, the Pietra Dura, which is this polished stone uh, in the city of uh, Dubrovnik, is so slippery that you really have to walk uh, slowly. It's that polished of a surface. So rubber shoes are not necessarily the best thing to walk around here. And the other, the other thing is, in the evening, with the wonderful Adriatic breezes, the city really comes to life. It's very easy to eat al fresco and enjoy a wonderful meal away from all the hubbub. It's an absolutely delightful town once the cruise passengers have left. We move on to the next city, which is not too far from Dubrovnik. It's about an hour away, and that is Split. Split has a World Heritage Site, which encompasses probably most of the ancient traditional city, and that's Diocletian's Palace. This palace was built in 295 under Domini on the Dalmatian coast. It's a rectangular palace which occupies a surface of approximately 29,000 square meters. Um, you still see uh, quite a bit of the remains of the old palace and of course uh, churches, cathedrals have been built but you still can see quite a bit of the traditional Roman architecture. Split is also located on uh, the Adriatic coast. So one of the lovely things in the evening is to go to one of those cafes or bars which are sitting right in front of the ocean and enjoy a coffee or a glass of wine or a beer and, and soak in the atmosphere. Very close to Split is yet another world to imagine this itinerary is filled with world heritage sites is the city of Trogir. Trogir uh, was actually a Venetian town uh, dating from approximately the 13th to the 15th century and it was completely built by the Venetian uh, uh, Republic. We have probably some of the best Romanesque uh, uh, art in the Cathedral of St. Lovro. 
uh, amongst all the European art styles, the Romanesque, which is, which precedes uh, the Gothic, is best represented in this amazing cathedral. Um, a lot of the work of preservation uh, is constantly being carried out, as the whole city, but in particular this cathedral, is a World Heritage Site. From here, we move on to Siebenik. Siebenik uh, also has an interesting cathedral. In this particular case, we are talking about the wonderful Renaissance Cathedral. Uh, once again, we can see all the Italian influence. The Cathedral of uh, Siebenik, uh, the, it's the Cathedral of St. James, was built during the Renaissance, and it's probably one of the best monuments uh, in terms of Renaissance, Italian Renaissance architecture, which we will find. From here, talking about all that influence of the, uh, of the Italians, we move on to Zadar. Zadar was the ancient capital of Dalmatia. Uh, as a matter of fact, Zadar was part of Italy until 1947. But even before that, we had a Roman forum, so this is the Roman main square. And then on, we come with the traditional Baroque and Venetian. You would think, if I show you this picture, that you're in Italy. But no, you're in Zadar, in uh, Yugoslavia, in Croatia. From here, we move to the next amazing World Heritage Site. This is Plitvice Lakes National Park. What is remarkable is here, 16 lakes, uh, each at a different level, join the other in a series of, of cascading waterfalls. Karstic rock, which is basically calcarean terrain, mainly dolomite and limestone, uh, associated with the lakes and with a whole area of the Dinaric Alps, make for this amazing landscape. The way you explore the lakes and the various waterfalls is by walking on these wooden paths. It's, the whole thing is so beautiful that UNESCO declared it a natural world heritage site. Finally, not really part of the Balkans, but still part of the former Yugoslavia, uh, we visit Slovenia, which is the only country which is part of the European Communion at present time. It has a population of 2 million inhabitants. Its capital city is the city of Ljubljana. Uh, the language spoken in Slovenia is Slovene, however, Hungarian and Italian are recognized. Actually, 30 languages are spoken in Slovenia. The alphabet here is Latin. Two-thirds of the population, roughly, is Roman Catholic. When we explore Ljubljana, <coughs> we will again feel that this is a, the Austro-Hungarian influence. As a matter of fact, Ljubljana was uh, rebuilt in the 16th century following a massive earthquake in uh, 1511. What is nice about Ljubljana, in many ways it very much, as I said, resembles Vienna. Um, you have, however, it's a Vienna in miniature. And the best way to explore the city is on foot because uh, all these various churches, cathedrals, or like look at this lovely market, are all easily reachable and easily easy to walk with on foot. Now we also include a wonderful tour to the island, or to Lake Bled, and the only island in uh, Croatia. It's the only island, and there's a little church on it, it's a Baroque church, dedicated to Our Lady of the Lake. We will also visit this on our extension tour of uh, Slovenia. On the way there, we stop in Lipitz. Lipitz is very, very famous for its horse breeding uh, stud farm. In uh, 1580, uh, the Austrian Archduke Charles, the son of Ferdinand I, established a stud farm here to breed horses for the very famous Spanish riding school in Vienna. And in Lipitz, they will do horse demonstrations very much the Lipitziner, which is the name of the horse. Uh, these are the same horses which perform at a Spanish riding school in the city of Vienna. Finally, land, uh, our last World Heritage Site is Postonia Cave. I mentioned the karstic terrain. Well, we will take you to all these wonderful caves, and it's perfectly lit and safe, as you can see from this walkway here, and explore the world underground. That whole part of 
of uh, the uh, of the uh, Piedmont of the Alps and the Balkans is all karstic terrain. Hence, we get beautiful caverns uh, and caves. Where this one is, for example, 27 kilometers long and approximately two million years old. In terms of the tours we offer, we have a complete tour which is called Balkan Mosaic. That goes for 20 days into Croatia, Montenegro, Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and the Republika Srpska. In the itinerary, basically follows uh, from Belgrade to Mokragora to Sargan, Vizgerat, where we see the bridge, Zlatibor, the beautiful park, Sirogoino, Studenica, Sobokanci, those two being cities of monasteries, Novi Pasar, the little village, Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, Skopje, the capital of Macedonia. Where on the way, we will also visit a monastery, spend a couple of days in Ori, go to Albania, where we visit Berat, Duris, Tirana, move on to um, Montenegro, where we visit Budva, Sencine, Kotor, Trebinje, Mostar, Medjugorje, Sarajevo, Dubrovnik, Split, Trogir, Zibenik and Zadar, the Pitsimid Lakes and Zagreb in Croatia. Now, this tour, this complete tour covers 14 World Heritage Sites. And if you add the Slovenia extension, which is uh, from Zagreb, we take you then to the Lipica Stad Farm or the Postonia Cave and on to Ljubljana, you would have 15 World Heritage Sites on this itinerary. Now, if this itinerary happens to be too long, we also have two other tours, one which is the Bal Balkan itinerary, in essence the same itinerary, except we end the tour in uh, Sarajevo. In this case, people will still see the relevant places in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, but they then uh, would e exit the tour before entering into Croatia. This is only 14 days. And we have another tour, which is a journey from Sarajevo to Bled, which basically just covers Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, and Slovenia. Uh, also, the Balkan mosaic for people who have a bit more time is ideally combined with our tours to Bulgaria, Romania, and uh, Moldova. So, these are various permutations. Now, Best Way Tours uh, is um, mostly specialized in customizing tours, so please talk to us because we can certainly adjust the tour to whatever your needs are. This particular tour includes uh, superior deluxe class hotels with uh, private facilities, the meals as they are indicated on the itinerary, tours and sightseeing us, uh, including the entrance fees of course, licensed English speaking guides throughout the land tours. Now, there will not be a specific guide which takes you to all, one guide will hand the client over to another one. Obviously, local taxes and service charges. And whenever you take a tour on Bestway, uh, we always will provide our clients with arrival and departure transfers. So people are looked after from the moment they land at the destination. Very important uh, to note, we really believe in intimate uh, group uh, sizes. Our minimum group size is two passengers, and our maximum is limited to 12 passengers. The whole idea here is we find that when you take a, a, a group which is la larger than that, a lot of time is spent in getting people on and off the bus, uh, in and out of the different uh, sites, souvenir shops, uh, restaurants, and this is time which people actually are wasting rather than spending at a destination. We have many, many years of experience, well over 30, in terms of customizing our tour programs to suit your own areas of interest and dates, whether that's for a single person or a small group. The whole idea, particularly when you're going from country to country, you have all these various borders, languages, and so on, and you need to do it in a relatively good pace. When you plan a trip with us, you will save time, money, and above all, hassle. At Bestway Tours, we are committed to providing you with superior quality travel at real value for dollar prices. For detailed uh, itinerary information, optional tours and additions, to get the exact details and dates and so on, I would encourage you to visit bestway.com, that's our website. Feel free to give us a call in Vancouver at 604-264-7378 
or give us a call toll free anywhere in Canada or the United States at 1-800-663-0844 or just send us an email to bestway at bestway.com. With this we conclude our webinar today. Uh, if there's any questions I would like to ask uh, you to type them in and I'll be more than happy to answer these for you. Are there any questions you might have? Aha, we have a question here in uh, regards to visas and, and border crossing fees and so on and so forth. Fortunately for Canadians and Americans, none of these countries uh, requires a visa uh, in any way, shape or form. So that makes travel from country to country actually quite easy. Any other questions? Well, I do thank you all for having participated uh, today. I do apologize for any mispronunciation uh, of Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, Albanian or Macedonian words. Um, and I do thank you. I would like to invite you for next week's webinar in which we are going to an entirely different part of the world. We are going on the wild kingdoms of, uh, on a safari to Kenya and Tanzania and I hope you enjoyed this as much uh, as I did my travels. Uh, definitely I can highly recommend a trip to the former Yugoslavia and Albania. It's one of the nicest destinations I've visited and it's still the traditional, the authentic experience in Europe. Thank you very much and I appreciate you having participated today.